Thank you, uh, Professor Joseph New, for an excellent talk. You have clarified most of the concerns that uh, impact on practicing neonatologists. And uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions related to clinical relevance of the topics you discussed, the gastric aspirates, the availability of SMOF. In UAE, recently, we have shortage of the intralipid, so most of us are using mainly the SMOF, uh, I mean, but we will discuss that in the discussion section as well. So thank you and look forward to the second lecture soon after Professor Paulin's lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for the next uh, lecture, which is uh, none other than Professor Paulin. He has already been introduced uh, by Dr. Junaid Khan in his previous lecture, but uh, suffice it to say that he's a real legend. He was inducted into the Legends Hall of Fame of the AP in 2017. He was already the chief resident when I was uh, learning to crawl. And he has uh, written not 20 articles, but 20 textbooks. And uh, all over the world, the uh, textbook which edited the uh, fetal and neonatal physiology has been a key uh, area of interest for all the budding neonatologists, and it continues to be the same. So without much uh, ado, I introduce uh, Professor Paulin and I request him to take on the topic, which is a bugbear in many neonatologists and also the postnatal pediatrician's mind, the blood sugar that we should target. Over to you, Professor Paulin. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Richard Poland speaking to you from New York in the United States. I hope you got to see my earlier lecture, which I recorded, uh, but this lecture I'm giving to you live uh, from New York. And I am just want to say it was great fun to hear my friend Dr. New talk about those topics about feeding practices. And this is another very, uh, I won't call it controversial, but important topic uh, for all pediatricians and neonatologists, and that is neonatal hypoglycemia. And as you can see, the, the sort of the second title of my talk is Beyond Quadrigenta Secophobia. And for those of you who are Latin scholars, you know that that refers to uh, the number 47 in Latin. And the 47, number 47 is of importance because it's one of the standard definitions for hypoglycemia in newborn babies. And my objective is just a single one. I want to bring evidence and as much science as possible to the recognition and management of neonatal hypoglycemia. And I'm going to start with a case presentation. And obviously, I can't see you this morning, but I all want you to think about the answer. This is an appropriately grown preterm baby at 36 weeks gestation. At one hour of life before the first feeding, a bedside test for glucose reveals a value of 24 milligrams per DL. That's about, I think, one and a half millimoles per liter. The infant is asymptomatic, looks well to you, what would you do? So I'm giving you three choices. One is observe the infant and repeat the bedside screen at four hours of life. Second is allow the infant to breastfeed and then uh, repeat a value 30 to 60 minutes later. Or you can give some intravenous glucose, standard dose being two cc's per kilogram of 10% dextrose, followed by continuous infusion. And I hope that you all chose uh, B, allow the infant to feed and repeat a value uh, 30 to 60 minutes later. And uh, if the infant cannot breastfeed, a formula feeding is okay, or dextrose gel or alternatives. So here's the topics I will cover in the next 30 minutes. So I'm gonna start with some fundamental concepts, uh, focusing on the hormonal responses to hypoglycemia. And then I'm gonna be speaking about a common, but often misidentified uh, uh, problem, and that is transient hypoglycemia, often called biochemical hypoglycemia. And then we're going to try to define hypoglycemia in babies, try to answer the question, does asymptomatic hypoglycemia have morbidities? And finally, give you some screening recommendations and some treatment recommendations. So the most important thing I'm going to say today is that significant hypoglycemia cannot be defined by a single number that can be universally applied to every single baby who may have different diseases ongoing, for example, respiratory distress syndrome, 
who are, or, who are at different gestational ages and have different physiology going on. And you'll hear me talk about alternative energy substrates and the significance of hypoglycemia often depends on the availability of those alternative energy substrates. So the new concept is not what glucose level is significant, but the concept is neuronal fuel balance. And obviously that does depend somewhat on blood glucose concentration. It also depends on the baby's condition. Is there ongoing hypoxia or, or was there perineal depression or is sepsis a likely diagnosis? And what are the alternative fuels? Alternative, main alternative fuels being ketone bodies, lactate, and certain amino acids. Alanine is shown here, but glutamine is also an important amino acid. So how do you incorporate all those variables? And the answer is by your examination. So clinical examination is the most important uh, thing you can do to determine whether a particular glucose level is adequate or inadequate. Now, through the history of hypoglycemia, lots of numbers have been applied to what is significant hypoglycemia. On the upper left part of the screen it are recommendations by, by Marvin Kornbluth. And probably many of you are not old enough to remember those recommendations. They were made in the late 60s and early 70s. And I'm going to talk about them, but he defined significant hypoglycemia as less than 20 in a low birth weight baby less than 2,500 grams, or less than 30 in a full-term baby in the first 48 hours of life, and then greater than 40. And we use those recommendations for many years. In about 2000 and I want to say about 15, the Committee of Fetus and Newborn made their own recommendations. And I'll show those to you later on the slide, but in the first 24 hours of life, you'll see them talk about levels of 35 to 45, and before discharge, uh, determining whether the levels are at least 60 milligrams per DL. Uh, and those recommendations are still used by many units in the US. The pediatric endocrinologists like to see higher values, especially any baby that requires glucose supplementation. So they say the glucose value should be greater than 70 before discharge. The number 47 is still in the literature. I mentioned, or I started off my talk, by speaking about quadriginja septum phobia, and that is number 47. And that was established by Alan Lucas in a classic paper, which I'll show you. But many neonatologists say, well, that's a lot of numbers. I'm just gonna to try to keep the glucose value between 55 and 110. Now, another important concept is the brain is the principal organ of glucose utilization, and newborns have a relatively large brain compared to their body weight. And if you look at the lower graph, we have a, a slide showing brain to body weight ratio. And you can see it's highest in the newborn period and goes progressively down with advancing age. Men and women have pretty much similar brain to body weight ratios. But are we, I always say that women, females have these larger brains. The other important concept is that there's a very limited reserve uh, capacity of fuel in the brain. So the brain is constantly dependent on delivery of adequate nutrients to maintain its energy uh, status. Now the long-term effects of what we call persistent asymptomatic hypoglycemia, so you get several values that you're concerned about, long-term effects are still controversial or unknown. There are no evidence-based studies that define glucose levels leading to irreversible brain damage in babies, Obviously, if, if hypoglycemia is associated with coma or encephalopathy or seizures, that's much more significant and much more likely to be associated with brain damage. And there's no evidence that treating what we call asymptomatic hyperglycemia is going to improve neurological outcomes. Now, the signs of hyperglycemia can be divided into two main categories. There's neurogenic, which we've all experienced when we skip a meal. So these are the adrenergic responses, palpitations or tremors, sometimes a feeling of anxiety or sweating. In adults, we know when that occurs, it occurs at 50 to 60 milligrams per dl. And then there are the newer glycopenic signs of hypoglycemia. And those are the ones we're most concerned about, coma or seizures, 
or marked evidence of brain dysfunction, and they're associated with values less than 50 milligrams per DL in adults. But no one has any good idea, at least if we've never determined, when newborn babies become neuroglycopenic. In healthy adults and children and healthy newborns, glucose concentrations are regulated within a fairly narrow range by a series of hormonal changes, and those are shown in this slide. So this is looking at the metabolic responses, or really hormonal responses, to a fall in plasma glucose in an adult. It's true for a child, and it's probably true for most newborn babies. The first response is a fall in insulin levels, leading to decreased peripheral glucose uh, utilization, which obviously leads to normal glycemia. Normal levels of glucose I have on this slide now in millimoles per liter are three and a half to uh, five and a half millimoles per liter. And then there's a series of hormonal responses shown in this box in the lower left, glucagon and adrenaline. Those are the principal hormones increasing glycogenolysis uh, by activation of adenase, adenate, 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 adenolate cyclase, which then leads to glucose release and to maintain normal glycemia. And then there's two other responses, in, increased glycogenesis, Glycogenesis, it can be increased by just about every hormone you see on the left. And glycogenesis obviously uh, increases glucose release. And then there's the lipo lipolysis. And lipolysis is important like, because it increases uh, glycerol. Glycerol is an important alternative fuel for the brain. Free fatty acids um, are not taken up by the brain, but free fatty acids can be converted to ketone bodies and ketone bodies are imp an important alternative fuel for the brain. And these are the general metabolic responses that adults and probably babies go through as glucose levels fall. Now, what we see most commonly is called transient or biochemical hypoglycemia, and that's shown in the slide. So shortly after birth, and I'll, I'll try to time it out for you in a second, glucose levels fall as a response, insulin falls, Glucagon is increased, which helps to mobilize glycogen. There's this transient fall followed by uh, restoration to a normal level. And these are relatively old data now from 1986, looking at the actual glucose levels now in healthy term babies who are experiencing transient or neonatal hypoglycemia. The mean values are shown in the blue. Two standard deviations are shown in the red and orange. And you see the mean values are falling to a level and now this is in milligrams per DL again, which we consider pretty normal, but two standard deviations from the mean, you can see you can get some fairly low glucose values. Here, during the period of fall of glucose, it can be between 20 and 40. And the endocrinologists, in, when they determine mean values or normal values, like to use these means, shown in the blue in the slide. The American Academy of Pediatrics tries to use what we call operational thresholds to provide a margin of safety. So they use a more broader range of glucose values. Now there's a difference in how quickly biochemical or transient hypoglycemia occurs in different gestational age babies and how and to what level of fall. So this is a study from 2018 uh, show and you can see the authors on the bottom of the slide. Elgin's babies are shown in the red dotted line, preterm infants, the green dotted line, late preterms, blue, and then the solid line are full-term babies. But you can see the extremely low gestational age newborns and, pre and preterm babies, which is up to about 32 weeks, between 28 and 32 weeks, they tend to fall to a lower level sooner and to a, a, a much lower level than either the late preterm babies greater than 34 weeks, but less than 37, or a full-term population. So the nadir and how quickly it occurs varies with gestational age. And these are some numbers from one of many studies looking at normal glucose values. Here you see various time intervals across the top, and then the mean levels to which they fall. They're all considered pretty normal levels. These data are, are on healthy, term babies. This is what we consider normal glycemia in a healthy term baby. But you can see that if you go down between one and two hours during the period of transient uh, or biochemical hyperglycemia, 
some healthy term babies will stay on to levels which are very low and then rebound to a level that we consider normal, but the fifth percentile can encompass levels that we consider low in newborn babies. By the way, a third of these babies were breastfed, and breastfed babies tend to have lower glucose values. In fact, here are data on uh, breastfed babies, again, looking at time intervals from three hours up to 72 hours. The mean values and median values were not different from what I just showed you, but the ranges, if you look at the red value in the ranges, they are much lower than we tend to see in formula-fed babies. But in general, breastfed babies have higher ketone bodies, and ketone bodies, uh, again, are an important alternative fuel for the brain in all newborn babies. And this study was published in 2020, and what makes it unique, uh, it's a study, again, on healthy term babies, and the population is 67 babies but they also did what's called continuous or interstitial glucose monitoring, where they get a continuous readout of glucose values. So the upper graph shows intermittent monitoring, the mean value, and then the 10th and 90th percentile. And the bottom graph looks at continuous or interstitial glucose monitoring. They're pretty much the same, but there were two interesting things from this study because they did continuous uh, monitoring. So First of all, I already spoke about that number of 47, and it's interesting that plasma glucose levels less than 47 approximated the 10th percentile in the first 48 hours of life. So here's a physiologic confirmation that 47 may be significant. But what is really interesting, when they did continuous glucose monitoring, that almost 40% of the healthy term babies had more than one value below 47. That's a lot of babies, uh, and most of those babies, in fact, I would say virtually all, never require treatment. So transient hypoglycemia can be associated with hyperinsulinemia. And that can be true for SGA babies, for preterm babies, or for LGA babies. And when you have hyperinsulinemia accompanying hypoglycemia, that's associated with decreased alternative fuels, such as lactate, uh, beta hydroxy and acetoacetate, which are the ketone bodies, and glycerol. So it's like a double whammy. Not only is the glucose value falling, but the alternative fuels are also falling. And the next two slides look at how well various age children and newborn babies can suppress insulin concentrations. So you can see here in children, insulin concentrations are suppressed completely below a value of about four millimoles per liter. And I should have said it, but to make the conversion, 18 milligrams per DL equals one millimole per liter. If you look at our term newborn babies and look at when they suppress insulin concentrations, it's at a much lower level, probably about two to three millimoles per liter. And these are data, uh, data on preterm babies who are not infants of diabetic mothers, and they go all the way down. So it's harder in a preterm baby to suppress, suppress insulin levels. That's why many preterm babies have the concurrent problem, or hypoglycemic, have the concurrent problem of hyperinsulinemia. And, and that's shown on the slide where the authors in 1993 look at core blood levels in preterm AGA babies who are about 32 weeks gestation, a group of term babies who were 39 weeks gestation, and a group of children. You can see the birth rates for the preterm and term AGA babies. In this study, the glucose values in core blood were all entirely the same when you compare them to those in children. Insulin levels, though, were much higher in our preterm AGA babies, lower but still higher than children in our term AGA babies and lowest than children. And because insulin levels are higher, ketone bodies were lower, lowest in our preterm AGA babies, moderately low in our term AGA babies compared with children. So again, all newborn babies can have hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia, but the problem is most significant in our preterm population. How do we define hyperglycemia? It's not easy. We can use epidemiologic or statistical studies based on measure ranges in healthy babies. We can look for clinical manifestations, not very helpful because when clinical manifestations occur, we're already concerned. We can look for changes in metabolic and hormonal balance, not commonly done in the NICU. Uh, 
Or we can look at neurodevelopmental outcomes. Again, that's not quite satisfactory because we want to avoid babies who have neurodevelopmental uh, abnormalities. This is the uh, report from the Committee of Fetus and Newborn, of which I was part of. David Ademkin is the uh, senior author in this paper. And it was published in about 2011. And it looks at that normal values for postnatal glucose homeostasis and who to treat. And the AP used operational thresholds. Uh, and operational thresholds provide a range, and we call a margin of safety before the infant becomes symptomatic. And that was counterbalanced by reports in the Pediatric Endocrinology Society, which I, I said already uses mean values, much more rigid values. And when the Pediatric Endocrinologists wrote the report, they called me up, and I, many of them are my, my friends from Philadelphia, Charlie Stanley, I think was the first author. And they said to me, you're using the wrong values. You should be looking at metabolic and hormonal data, which we did not do. You're missing cases of persistent hypoglycemia, which I don't think we do. And you're not treating infants with persistent hypoglycemia effectively and placing them at risk for brain injury. And before I show you some of the definitions, I'm gonna just quote an article by Bill Hay, who's clearly one of the world's leader in hypoglycemia. And here are the concepts he put forward, that a statistical norm based on normative data does not define a biological norm. So any value you see, 30, 40, even 50, does not de define biologic norm for a particular baby. It depends on how sick the baby is and how whether there are alternative fuels. It also does not define this concept of newer glycopenia uh, when irreversible brain damage occurs. So Picking a number is not very helpful, or one number is not very helpful for newborn babies. So I mentioned Marvin Kornblatt, and for years, this is what I followed when I was a fellow in neonatology. And again, in the first two days of life, in full-term infants, they look for values less than 30. In LBWs, less than 2,500 grams, they look for values less than 20. And beyond 48 to 72 hours, they said glucose value should be greater than 40. In fact, they look at babies who they felt were symptomatic at a level of 25, and their symptoms resolve when the values go up to 40s, suggesting that perhaps their ranges are okay. And they concluded that if glucose concentration is safe, if clinical signs associated with hypoglycemia are not observed, or if signs disappeared after treatment. And that paper from 1959 became the classic standard. But if you look at it carefully, that clinical approach, I would say, is flawed. There is no follow-up data. As you know, that babies who are, have hyperglycemia often have other clinical problems that can cause clinical signs that can be confused with hyperglycemia. So the clinical signs may not be specific for hyperglycemia. And Dr. Kornblatt did not look for alternative uh, energy su substrates that might protect the brain. Now, the largest study, and one which is a significant paper and which helped to define that level of 47 uh, quadrogen to septophobia, was by Alan Lucas, published uh, in the BMJ in 1988. This is a study on preterm babies. You can see their birth weight gestational age over here. A very large nutritional study of over 660 babies that had close to 7,000 samples. They took this, these samples, it was intermittent sampling daily for the first two to three weeks of life, and then weekly until discharge or they reach 2,000 grams. And then importantly, they did developmental testing. So they said, we rarely saw severe hypoglycemia. That's a value less than 6.6, 0 0.6 millimoles per liter, or serum glucose in milligrams per GL less than 10. That was rarely noted. But values less than 47 were commonly noted and they were seen in 16% of babies over the first three to 30 days of life. And if you look at the population of babies less than 1,000 grams, almost 40% had values less than 47 over the first three to 30 days of life. So again, that's similar to the study I showed you previously, but asymptomatic hypoglycemia that values less than 47 are very, very common in newborn babies. But they looked at newer developmental, developmental outcomes of values less than 47, 
And they showed that values less than 47, or which is 2.6 millimoles per liter, were strongly related to mental and motor skill development. Of what they, how they define hyperglycemia less than 47 or less than 2.6 was zero. There was no development of delay. If it occurred in three to four days, the uh, odds ratio was 2.2. And if it was greater than five days, the odds ratio is 3.5 to one. But when they looked at seven to eight years, there was no difference in developmental outcomes on the number of days in which they had hypoglycemia. And if you start to pick a value less than 47 or less than 2.6 millimoles per liter, you're gonna be looking at a lot of low glucose values. So this paper published by Harris in 2012 looked at various populations, LGA babies in green, IDM babies in sort of purple, growth restricted babies in light blue and preterm babies in the light brown. But you can see how frequently values less than 47 are noted the percentages are shown for each group of babies. So it, it's not practical to choose a value less than 47 as significant. And when Win Chin, among many studies, looked at newer developmental outcomes with values less than 47, they couldn't demonstrate an abnormality or increased abnormalities in the babies that experienced values less than 47 who had more than three days of, uh, of low glucose values versus controls who never had low glucose glucose values less than 47. And here are their outcomes. And the index cases with more than three days less than 47 are shown in turquoise. The controls who had never had values less than 47 are shown in red. And you can see whether you pick general IQ or motor abnormalities or eye-hand coordination or school performance, absolutely no difference in babies who had several days of hypoglycemia versus those who had none. Now, this is another very important study by McKinley in 2015. What makes it unique is they did both intermittent glucose monitoring and continuous glucose monitoring using the interstitial glucose device. However, the interstitial glucose levels were masked to the care provider, so they never saw them. In this study, any value uh, less than 47 uh, was treated. So they tried to maintain all values greater than 47. It was treated either with supplemental feedings or IV glucose or dextrose gel. So what were the results of this study? By the way, I think I already said it, but these are babies who are late preterm babies greater than 35 weeks gestation. So half the babies had values less than 47, again showing not very practical as a normative value. 25% of babies had glucose concentrations that could be only detected by the continuous glucose monitoring or interstitial monitoring. And 25% of babies treated for hypoglycemia had at least five hours of low interstitial value. So it was completely unrecognized by the care providers. When intermittent monitoring was used to identify infants with a value less than 47, hypoglycemia was not associated with any newer developmental impairments. The risks were not increased by the number of unrecognized episodes detected by the interstitial monitoring. However, and this is important, the cognitive delay was associated with higher glucose concentrations and less glucose stability. So what they're saying is low glucose values didn't appear to be significant, but high glucose values were. And these, this is a slide from their paper in the Journal of Medicine, uh, I want you to focus on the graph on the left, and the red line is neurosensory impairment, and the babies who had the highest incidence of neurosensory impairment had the highest values for, by interstitial glucose monitoring compared to babies who had lower glucose values. So it looks like maybe the treatment is worse than the hypoglycemia directly. However, they did look at values less than at, at four and a half years of life in a subsequent study in pediatrics, this is a subpopulation of 470 babies with hypoglycemia less than 47. They looked at babies, they had a severe episode, which meant less than 36, or recurrent episodes, about 19% of babies have recurrent babies. Again, hypoglycemia was not associated with newer sensory impairment, but they did find some abnormalities. Hypoglycemia was associated with some abnormalities in executive function, and visual motor integration. But children who developed these impairments, between two and a half and five years, 
had a steeper rise in interstitial glucose concentrations. So once again, they could detect abnormalities, but they appear to be related to babies who had higher glucose levels detected by the interstitial glucose monitoring. And this is a study, I think the last one I'm gonna show you, that looks at treating babies at a threshold of 36, or treating babies who had a threshold of 47. And these were babies all who had, who were at least 35 weeks and had a weight greater than 2,000 grams. It encompassed all of our high risk groups for hypoglycemia, IDMs, LGA babies, and late preterm, SGA and late preterm babies. And they looked at development at 18 months of life. It was a non inferiority study. And basically, mean cognitive scores, whether you treat it at a value of 36 or 47, and mean motor scores were not significantly different. It does not mean that a value of 36 is safe for all babies. There's still some criticism of this study published in the England Journal, but in the majority of babies, even quite low glucose concentrations were okay. And let me end it by speaking about who should be screened and uh, that list is relatively long, but most of it are for babies that you would screen anyway. Any kid or any baby who has signs that you believe are due to hypoglycemia, like jitteriness. Our four main groups are IDMs, LGA babies, premature, post-mature, and growth-restricted babies. But babies who have sort of perinatal distress, for example, perinatal depression, are worth screening. Family history of genetic forms of hypoglycemia, and infants with syndromes associated with hypoglycemia, like Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome. But healthy babies do not require glucose monitoring. Who should be investigated for severe hypoglycemia? Uh, persistent, persistent hypoglycemia. Any baby who is symptomatic or required prolonged treatment for IV with IV dextrose. Any baby unable to maintain a value greater than 60 by day three. Again, family history of hypoglycemia, where there may be a suspected genetic form and congenital syndromes. And I'll be done in just a few minutes. Principles of treatment, earlier identification of babies at risk for hypoglycemia, restoration of glucose to a normal level, but there's no data that restoration of glucose concentrations to a normal level improves outcome. Again, our four high-risk babies, this is what the Committee of Fetus and Newborn says, and it's what they've reaffirmed recently. If a baby is, this is looking at the high risk groups for hypoglycemia now, if the baby's symptomatic and has a value less than 40, give that baby IV glucose. If the baby's asymptomatic and it's between birth and four hours of life, the initial feed should be within an hour and then a screening of uh, glucose 30 minutes after the first feed. Remember, these are the high-risk babies. If the initial screen is less than 25, feed and check in an hour. If it's still persistently less than 25, give IV glucose. If it's between 25 and 40, refeed the baby. Think about IV glucose. And here are the recommendations for four to 24 hours. If it's less than 35 at that point, they recommend IV glucose between 35 and 45, they recommend refeeding. Think about IV glucose. But again, always keep in mind that hyperglycemia or the treatment of hyperglycemia may be more significant. Now here's my final slide. I've given you a lot of guidelines, but even the one from the Committee of Fetus and Newborn is not perfect. There's little consensus on what is safe asymptomatic hyperglycemia and transient hyperglycemia. Most data indicate that they're safe, especially if the baby is asymptomatic. Infants with transient hypoglycemia should not go home unless they can maintain a value greater than 60 through several feed fast cycles. And the Pediatric Endocrine Society in the US might say 70, and that's my last, uh, uh, slot, last statement, is that values, uh, any baby who requires treatment should have a value less than 70, it's what the pediatric endocrinologists say. Persistent and recurrent hyperglycemia requires an endocrine evaluation. So I want to thank you for inviting me. It's fun to be delivering this lecture live to you.